what makes fantasy epic. So um, it'll be great. We've got four panelists here that are just <coughs> so diverse in their writing styles and, and um, a credit to the, the profession. Um, so I think we're going to have some great viewpoints on this. First of all, from your left, we've got Marianne de Pierre. She's the author of the acclaimed Parish Places award-winning Sentience of Orion science fiction series. Uh, she's also written the Burn Bright uh, Dark Teen, uh, Teen Dark Fantasy series um, that's published through Random House. And she also writes under Marianne Delacourt, the Tara Sharp crime series with Ellen and Unman. Please welcome Marianne de Pierre. Next we have Kylie Chan. She's the best-selling author of The Dark Heavens and The Journey to Wudang Wudang Trilogy. Uh, Kylie also has uh, Small Shan, which is her first uh, voy uh, voyage into graphic novel territory, um, as well as Dark Servant, which is just about sold out. No, it's 100% sold out, sorry. Sorry, it was a pre-release uh, picture being published next month. We're taking orders. Yes, they will be signed and sent out tomorrow. Excellent. Please welcome Kylie Chan. Next we have Colin Tabor. He's actually written over 100 magazine articles, published uh, in the, notably in the Australian Realms magazine. Uh, he's the author of The Fall of Ozard uh, trilogy, and uh, he's got another two books. Well, one book? Oh, that's the two Assad books and uh, the United States of Finland, the new release. Excellent. Please welcome Colin Tabor. Um, lastly, but not leastly, we have Katie Taylor, um, who writes under KJ Taylor. Sorry for using her other name. Um, she was first published when she was nearly 18 years old. Uh, and she is now going to write The Dark Griffin in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, Griffin's Flight, Griffin's War in the same year, and she's just recently written her new Griffin books, Shadows Air and Shadows Throne. Please welcome KJ Taylor. Ah, wasn't sure if this was on. <laughs> yeah, we're always on. A, a question that I like to um, uh, ask is the beautiful what if question, which is what all authors start with that one simple question, what if? If you could tell us your what ifs for your story so we can all get to know a little bit more about what you write. We'll start with Katie. You know, I, I really like that you asked that because I once did an entire workshop based on what if. Every story begins with what if. Uh, well, okay, the way I started with, with my Griffin series, that's the, the, the Fall of Moon trilogy and the Risen Sun trilogy, and there are more to come. Um, Basically, um, it's you know it's a story about griffins and people, right? So like, the people who partner with griffins and get to run on their backs and all that. And um, the way I started out with that is that um, I had never liked dragon rider stories, and like not since I was a child. I don't know why. It's just the whole concept kind of bugged me, and I was like, well, you know, what is it that I don't like about it? And you know, what if I wrote it, you know, in such a way that it didn't bug me in a way that it made more sense, in a way that I liked. Uh, and so, and I, and I, so I came up with this idea, and I was like, well, I can't do another dragon writer story, no one wants to read another one of those. So I thought, well, why not use griffins? No one really writes about griffins very much. So basically it was, it was yeah, what if I reimagined the whole idea of, of dragon writers and uh, made it in such a way that, that I liked it? What was your what if, Colin? Um, well, alternate histories are all about the what-if question, and uh, my new series is uh, something I've been working on for the last four years. So the first book's called The Landing, uh, the series is The United States of Finland, and the question is, what if the Norse who had uh, arrived and settled in Greenland and explored North America, uh, the northeast corners of it, what if they'd actually settled, and what happens to the timeline from that point? Um, the Norse uh, named the area Vinland, and so instead of a United States of America, the, the timeline will take us through to a United States of Vinland. Instead of, instead of a Bible belt, um, you'll have a Bible belt where people are following Odin and Thor. And um, in 1492, for example, um, you'll have Columbus arriving to find the Eastern Seaboard already well and truly populated by uh, European stock 
who, uh, quite frankly, aren't particularly pleased to see the arrival of anyone else. And um, there's, a, a, there's so many different ways you can run that through, what happens with world wars, you know, uh, who, who settles what, uh, you'll get a, eventually an imperial and a colonial uh, competition between Europe and, and, and this uh, Norse America. Um, but the initial book is about the initial settlement, and uh, they're effectively, it's a, effectively a play on the pilgrims going to uh, North America to escape uh, religious persecution, except for these happen to be followers of the gods of Asgard, who uh, are heading across many centuries before the uh, British did. But um, it, it's a, it's a, it's styled as an action adventure read, so it's a pacey read. Um, a lot of alternate history can be a bit dry and rests a lot on the whole twist. This is um, trying to be a lot more sort of entertaining, character driven, just a pacey, page turning kind of plot. While we, um, while we do eventually explore that full timeline. So yeah. And it is too, by the way. I've been reading it. <laughs> Some of the faces we've got here, I think we're going to get a rush of people down yeah. <laughs> asking about this one. It is yeah. fascinating. Yeah, it's a, it's 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 only these are advanced copies that are actually here. The release is a May one release, um, but it has been available in the US for the past month, and it's yeah, um, great reviews coming through. So I'm really pleased with it. It's I can see it's um, going to be busy for quite a while. Um. I lived in Hong Kong for 10 years and the Chinese mythology is wild, um, stupid, um, it, it's self-contradictory and the gods are absolutely marvellous. They're very similar to the uh, Olympic gods in that they're a bunch of very, very bad children. And so after having lived in Hong Kong, I um, decided to put those gods in the modern day what if a god could get stuck in a traffic jam? Um, and and uh, wrote from the point of view of a young Australian woman so that you have that Western viewpoint of the Chinese culture. Um, after living in Hong Kong for 10 years, I, I was writing dry commentaries for my family about what it was like because there's just so many things that are completely different. Um, the tiny flats were the first thing that drove me nuts. But, I realised that dry commentaries are really boring, so instead I, I wrote a, a wild, stupid fantasy and included the Chinese gods. And and through what it, what the lifestyle in Hong Kong is like as as part of the story. Yeah, that's it. Go, Maria. Uh, I became quite uh, fascinated. Uh, probably ten years ago, I read a story by an American author called Nancy Cress about sleeplessness. About uh, it was about a society where a percentage of the people never had to sleep and the rest, rest of them were kind of like us. So that's been with me for years and years and um, I eventually, it's interesting how a, a writer's psyche works, it eventually kind of bubbled up into this series, Third Right, which is my most recent series, the Night Creatures series, and my what if was, well, what if... Um, a whole bunch of teenagers never had to sleep and they were all living on an island that was in complete darkness all the time. And this island was really just populated with nightclubs and parties. Um, sounds like heaven. Well, it sounds like what I would have thought was heaven when I was 17, 18. But, uh, so that was my, my what if. It was what happens to people that never have to sleep and live in complete darkness. Uh, because there's all sorts of changes that, that occur to the body, of course, naturally, if, you're in, if you never have sunlight. So it's amazing where a story will take you if you ask that basic question. So who would like to answer the question, what is epic fantasy? <laughs> oh, well, I, I think Miss Taylor. <laughs> Can I be excused? I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, because um, the thing is that I've actually, uh, you know, a couple of years ago I was in San Diego and I was on a panel called Epic Fantasy, and I thought they were going to ask me what is epic fantasy. So I spent a lot of time thinking about it, but they never actually asked me. So it means I've still got that answer ready. That's that, that's why I was like, I know. I know. <laughs> you can wait all this time. Uh, well, in my opinion. Um, I mean, epic fantasy, a lot of people probably think, you know, castles and, and, and that sort of thing. 
in my opinion, the word epic really means big. It means larger than life. It, well, not necessarily, but it can. But basically it means, you know, a big story with big locations and big characters and basically just big everything. That, that's what epic fantasy suggests to me. Uh, I mean, what do you guys think? Because it's not it doesn't have to be, you know, medieval or even ancient. Yeah. Because, you know, space sci-fi can be epic too. That's right. I, uh, I, I see it as the big, uh, you're quite right, big. Uh, but in terms of this, uh, the sweep of um, whether it's powerful forces, um, you know, it, it doesn't need to be perhaps military, it could be cultural, it could be all kinds of things, it quite frankly could just be emotional. It's about it's about big forces in whatever form format that, that the story is dealing with, about them clashing really, or, or you know, the story of these things unfolding. Yeah, you know, whether it's the you know, the fall of an empire or some or the rise of a civilization. The rise of a civilization. Or uh, you know, the, the, the clash of, of mighty armies, or you know, all religions, or, or whatever it might be. But it's about it's about big canvas stuff, and it's about big sweeping things that, that are generally bigger than one person. Though obviously, it might one person might be what's leading the whole thing, uh, who's driving it. But the uh, and, and you know, religion is a good example of that. You know, um, you might have a prophet who is starting something or, or leading something. But, it, but in the end, you're talking about things that, that are just really powerful forces. What I wanted to know is, maybe Marianne and Kyla can answer this, what do you think draws a reader to a, an epic fantasy? That's part of my answer on what epic fantasy is. Fat books. <laughs> <laughs> and people who read fast and have big imaginations go into the bookstore and go, this is a lovely fat <laughs> and it's going to get uh, give me a lot of enjoyment for my money. So yeah, t just taking it from a completely different angle there. Um, my my latest book has come out in trade format, which is bigger. And um, to because they know that people are OCD about the size of the books on the shelf. And this has nothing to do with me. I would not have made the choice. Um, they have decided to release the first three, which are already BFFs, big fat fantasies. Um, they're releasing the first three books as an omnibus edition in the bigger trade format, so it would be the same size as the latest one. And they were on the phone to me saying, you know, here's the cover, it's going to be X centimetres wide. It's, and they said, it's of George R.R. R. Martin proportions. Oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's probably the definition of epic, because it's just, hell yeah. <laughs> A thousand characters and a million uh, yeah, storylines, and I mean, damn. Exactly. I don't know if I'm super qualified to give a definition of epic fantasy being primarily a science fiction writer, but I've certainly written epic science fiction. Yeah, uh, there's the word epic. And um, there's, I, I think, the epic story offers us. Uh, the individual journey, or the journey of individual characters, and in the case of George R. R. Martin, hundreds of individual characters. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, their their story, their journey occurs, um, uh, uh, you know, over um, a, a vast backdrop, and uh, uh, and often a backdrop that. It's, it's kind of a, an important story, so it gives the individual an important story to be part of, and I think that we all really enjoy that. Um, plus, I, I think it's a little bit like television. We love television because it's serialised and we keep coming back to those same characters that we love, that we're comfortable with, that we know, we feel like they're our friends, and epic fantasy, because it's so fat, gives us that really satisfying, um, connection with those characters over a long period of time. I mean, people complain and whinge about Robert Jordan's books, how long they've taken to come out, and will it ever finish, and, but they stay with the series because they have to know what happens to those characters. You actually mentioned about characterisation in epic fantasy. How different is it to write a character for an epic fantasy than it would be for literature or a crime or um, <laughs> any other genre? Well, Marianne will know that question. <laughs> <laughs> Katie, go. Katie, go. 
Oh, well, I would say it's, in the end, really no different. Because characters are how you connect to the story, and, you know, so... You would ex if, if you're going to write them well, they've, they've got to be relatable human beings, no matter what's happening to them. Because it, it's even more important in epic fantasy and science fiction as well, I would think, because you're de dealing with really outlandish concepts, which means that you're at risk of losing the reader. So if you keep the characters grounded, it means that the reader can stay grounded as well. Oh, and in literature, the characters are universally hateful. <laughs> boring, actually. And boring. <laughs> well, you know, boring makes them hateful, but they, you know, making them complete jerks helps as well. Alcoholics as well, they have to be. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, well of course. I mean, you know, we've we reached into the choir. Oh, Everybody we're knows that. Literary fan, literary fan. <laughs> bad. Yeah, bad. yeah, look, there's good characters in all fiction. Well-drawn characters in all fiction and poorly drawn characters in all fiction. All arts are of value. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I, I think Annie's probably right. There's probably no, no difference. Um, but you get to experience them in a slightly different manner because you're with them for so much longer, I think. Uh, so, uh, and you might be with generations of them, even. Yeah. Them, yeah. them and their children and their children's children. And there would be a tendency to make them larger than life as well. I was just going to say, the uh, I think the characterizations are quite similar, but the, one of the differences in the story structures is if you're doing epic fantasy or you're some kind of epic genre of fiction, you're obviously, uh, just the proportion of the book that might be dealing with character development and that sort of thing might just be a little bit less because you're obviously also fitting in these other bits and pieces about the, the actual backdrop, when, and Marianne said that before, and that was a very good word, that's what epic's about in many ways. It's about a story happening against an epic backdrop. Um, that becomes its own character, and um, you know, sometimes the forces involved in that become their own characters, uh, which, you know, just, it, it's a, really just uh, means it needs its, its screen time as well, effectively, so, yeah. Each one of you have been very drawn to different fantasy elements or fantasy creatures um, and, and each one of you have sort of tackled it and it was a really wonderful and refreshing way you, not, you know um, Marianne you've you've got your night creatures which I'll that let you don't, don't. I'll let you describe <laughs> how, how you and, and why were you attracted to rewriting this particular creature um, this is interesting. Which one was Tell me if I'm saying Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I have a creature in the Night, Night Creatures series, so there's a few different creatures, but one called the Riper. And when I started writing this series, there was a, a you know, a, an absolute glut of vampire fiction on the market. And, um, but while I, I'm not attracted to writing about vampire fiction. I like a lot of the, the trappings that go with vampire fiction, which is the, the gothic kind of styling. So what I did essentially is, is create these characters, the writers that are, have a, a gothic s a styling about them. And when you read the story, you keep thinking, well, what are they? What are these creatures? Are they vampires? No, they're not vampires. They're actually alien creatures, but you don't you don't really understand that until you get quite into the story. So um, I suppose they're my weird fantasy slash science fiction hybrid. Uh, and that's, that's the kind of creature that I've created. And it's a really funny thing when you create a creature because I don't know about you guys, but um, I find I have to get some type of visual connection with that creature. So I either go looking for pictures or I draw pictures. Now, China, uh, Kylie had a Chinese god, so I guess there's lots of representations of them already. Yeah. Um, but I'd be interested to know whether the others, you know, actually drew their own. And, and I cannot draw, so my rivals are very sad little creatures. But um, uh, that's really important to me. And I ended up scouring the internet and finding things that approximated them. And that reinforced my notion of them. So. And I'll just quickly add that another thing that I do when I'm creating creatures, often particularly science fictional creatures, is I'll look to micro life. So I'll go, I've actually got a couple of wonderful books of micro life, and um, they give me that, that visual representation of what I'm looking for. And I created a whole alien species uh, based on tardigrades, which are little water bears. 
and um, they're so wonderful to use because they can survive in a vacuum, they can survive extreme heat, they can survive extreme cold, they don't need to eat, they can hibernate for hundreds and hundreds of years. So I, I use that as the basis of my creature. So there's all sorts of resources out there for you if you're stuck on creating a creature. Chinese gods, um, I had to update them for a modern setting and the depictions in Chinese mythology are very, very ugly. So, um, yeah, I updated them, I made them more modern, I gave them some characteristics that um, I, 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 I've stretched, I have stretched the envelope a little bit. But in many ways, I, I've stuck to canon. There's a bunch of old ladies underneath the Canal Road in Causeway Bay who will uh, curse someone if you give them 50 bucks. <laughs> it's a business. They, I've never done it, so I don't know. But they have a very, very good business. Uh, and what they do is they have a paper white tiger, which is one of the characters from my books. And after you've read my books, you understand why this particular is involved, but uh, they will they will ask you to bring a shoe, and they will bash the white tiger and curse whoever you want to, to be cursed. Yes, so it, 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 it was wonderful using the the existing characters and updating them, and yeah, that was fun. Uh, for, for my latest book, there's. There's not really a fantastical element about it. Some of the storytelling and their suggestions about, you know, is this divine intervention? Is Thor helping them you know, when there's thunder? Is it Thor's hammer? Um, but with Viking uh, culture and all Norse culture and um, Norse mythology, they have a, a lot of superstitions or beliefs in relating to uh, things like uh, a, good, a really good example is someone coming out of fog or someone coming from the sea. Um, the sea's the great unknown, so if you're coming from the sea and they thought you were dead, they're assuming you are dead and what's coming is actually some kind of possessed creature. And um, you, you know, so part of what I've done with that is there is, a, in the current book and in the future books, there'll be a lot of scene building around that to help reinforce, particularly for readers who aren't necessarily familiar with Norse mythology and culture when, they, when they're reading it. So they, they, they're educated at the same time. They realise that this guy's not just coming on a boat drifting through fog, but the actual, the whole fact that the uh, Norse who are watching this person arrive are, um, uh, you know, uh, packing their dacks is what I'll say because they, they, they realise that this person who's coming is not just some guy who's been missing for three years or something like that, but actually it's the devil himself in their, in their cultural context. But that'll be, um, you know, built around. Um, here in my fantasy, I do, uh, quite frankly, similar to what Mary Ann does, um, I try and find a picture of something so that you've got something to go to. Um, I actually do the same for my characters, so I'll find a a face and um, I'll just do a, little, a bit of a character note about it in terms of eye colour, hair colour, height, what his skills are or you know, what his um, sort of ancestry is, just so that I know when I'm referring back to it, I've got like a cheat sheet because you know, we all hate it when suddenly a character's brown eyes become blue 50 pages later. Um, I don't want to hear about it, it's happened. Uh, but <laughs> but I, that, that's the way I work. Uh, it, but I mean, you know, part of, particularly when something's arriving for the first time, it's all, all about grand entry as well, you know. Katie, you mentioned before about the griffins. Just quickly, what, what, why griffins? Oh, well, I did mention earlier because dragons have been done to death. But I was going to say, I also draw my creatures. And um, I usually base them on something that already exists. Possibly lack of imagination, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I decided to do griffins because they were, they were something new, basically, because they, they weren't really being done so much. Um, there are some, some other griffin books around, but you know, all in all, people usually stick with dragons. Um, and, and I mean, and also there was the fact that I was using griffins instead of dragons meant that there, were, there weren't as many preconceived ideas. People wouldn't go in thinking that they would, because you know, a dragon, dragon is a big word. There are, dragons can look like just about anything. Griffins, though, half the time when I told people I was writing a book about griffins, they said, what's that? 
which is why at the beginning of the Dark Griffin, or practically the first page, I included a very detailed description of, of a griffin. And some person actually says to me, well, that's not necessary. And I was like, yes, it is. <laughs> um, so what I did was, with the griffins was, um, before I started, I did some research. I basically just looked it up, you know, like, what, what is the mythology about griffins? What do they say about them? Because I didn't really know that much about the things. Um, and I found out that griffins are closely associated with the sun in mythology. So I decided that, uh, that, that some of my people would be sun worshippers. And um, I also found out that uh, they're, they're said to uh, hoard treasure like dragons do. So I added a thing about how they, they, um, how they, they like shiny things, basically. And uh, I basically wrote them the way I, in, a, in a way that I thought would make sense. So, you know, you've got lion and eagle together. Those are two very aggressive, violent, dangerous creatures, and they're also very haughty. Um, and I actually have a friend who keeps birds of prey, and she, tell, she told me that, that, yes, that's exactly what eagles and, and falcons and things are like. So I, I wrote my griffins to be vain, arrogant, selfish, ambitious. They are intelligent, but there are different kinds of intelligence. So they, they, they have human-level intelligence, but in different ways. So, you know, they say that there's creative intelligence, social intelligence, mathematical intelligence, that sort of thing. So, griffins don't have social intelligence. They have no concept of love, for instance. Uh, like, it just, they just don't understand what it means. They, that's, that's a human thing. Uh, they have no real concept of loyalty, not to ideas. They are loyal to themselves, first and foremost. So, they, they do choose people to be their partners. But, if a griffin chooses you, then you are now that griffin's property, basically. The griffin expects you to feed it, to give it a good place to live, to you know, like brush its coat, clean its claws, and the griffin also expects you to climb the, the social ladder. Because, because my griffins are ambitious and arrogant, and they basically, they, they all want the best for themselves. So, you know, if you have a character who, who takes on a griffin, and that griffin will say, you know, okay, we're gonna find a place for ourselves, and we're gonna, we're gonna claw and scrape because I want the best. And um, a particular thing that they get is when their human is given a higher position, the griffin is given these metal rings to wear on its front legs, and the, mo the more important the position, the, the, the better the rings are. So they, they, they start from silver and go all the way up to like gold with gemstones, and they, they, they prize those very highly, because they're like, these are symbols of how great I am. So they, they like the shiny stuff. We were actually um, coming right to the end of our panel time, so I'm probably going to have time for one question, so do I have to be... Um, oh. So I was just wondering, Kylie, for example, one of the big questions in your books are, what is Emma? And um, I was wondering, do you guys know the ending of your books when you start, or do you, do you as you're writing, your character develops, and you're like, ooh, ooh, so this is and that, or is it all set out before you start? Uh, yeah, I always start with an end in mind because I find that um, I, I need that for the narrative drive. My style, my personal writing style is that I have very strong narrative drive generally in my books. So if I don't know what's going to happen in the end, it's very easy to wander. Uh, and sometimes you can wander into dead ends or around, circle, around in circles. So that's how I work best. And I tend to work in quite a linear fashion and a lot of writers don't. They'll write in chunks but I like to write from beginning to end because I get my sense of timing um, from that. Have you read book seven? Um, I'm about half my Because that's just all about what Emma is uh, to be. <laughs> 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 Full accurate historical description of what she is, what the, uh, what the effects are. I know, I'm sorry, I've been dragging you on for six books, but there it is, you get it. Okay. The end of the book is already written. The end of the whole series has been written for a long time. In fact, uh, in book eight, you know the little poems I put at the start and the end? That's going to become something that's integral to book eight. And yeah, so yeah, it's right from the beginning. The character a certain character has not been seen with a certain other character because of a big reveal at the end of book six. I'm a terrible person to keep you dragging up for so long. Well, what's the point of reading if there's no mystery? <laughs> That's true. Um, yeah, I, I always plan out the ending. Um, that's not to say that some aspects of how you get there change along the way. I mean, quite frankly, they do. 
Um, maybe not for everybody, but I believe yeah, that if the story is going to do some organic growth on the way, maybe because uh, particular characters sort of uh, blossoming in a way that wasn't planned, then then fine, then it all works for the story. Um, the, the Assad books are, are it's actually a, it's a dark fantasy, but it's a trilogy about hope. So um, it's all about this last failing spark and how it's about to catch, hopefully, if it doesn't. That's it for the world. So uh, it needs to catch. Um, it's it's really going to be a very big epic ending for the United States of Inland. Um, it's Norse mythology, Norse culture. The ending is Ragnarok. There is nowhere else to go. Um, really, in that terms, because the whole series is going to cover a thousand years of history, so it takes us basically to 2000 AD. It's it's the equivalent for us of World War Three. It's not necessarily going to be the number they would use for it, but um, that's where it, that's where it's heading. But that is further in the series because we're progressing book by book through the timeline. But that's the only logical place to go. Um, I, I, you don't even have to think about it in that sense. That's where the storyline has to go. What will vary is all the characters through it. Well, I generally start with um, at least. Uh, with a pretty firm idea of how it's going to end. Sometimes the ending changes as I get towards it, but usually I know where I'm heading. I mean, I, my Griffin books are a, a series, and I'm intending to write 15 books. I'm on book 12 at the moment, but yeah, only six of them are actually published. You're worse than me. <laughs> <laughs> only five, I mean. <laughs> yeah, well. Um, but, but each of my trilogies has its own ending, so it's, you know, each one has its own story. Oh, she's not worse than me. <laughs> but there are certain subplots and things that carry through the whole way and that will make the, the final ending so I know how the series is going to end. That ending has changed several times, but uh, I, I've now made a pretty firm decision. So I know where it's heading and it's important to know where you're going. The, the stuff in between changes. I mean, Terry Pratchett put it very well. Because uh, I don't plan my books. I, I, it's never worked for me. I'd never stick with the plan if I wrote one. And Terry Pratchett doesn't either. He apparently said, when I start a book, it's like I'm standing on the top of a mountain, and, I, um, and below me is a misty valley, and on the other side is the top of another mountain. I can see bits and pieces of what's between me and the other mountain, but not all of it. So I'll find it out along the way. It's surprisingly poetic for him, I think. There's a line in book seven. That's for you. There's a line in book seven. Now, Leo says to Emma, well, you know what you are now. Congratulations. Fantastic. Unfortunately, we have run out and the other panel is waiting for us. But, lucky for you, these fine four authors will be going back to the Dimmick stand. Follow them, stalk them, buy their books, <laughs> ask them all your questions that you've been busting to, to ask them here. But I would like you first to put your hands together and please thank <laughs>